All right, folks, welcome back. Our core topic for the day is retrieval augmented generation. This is, as I mentioned, perhaps the most dominant use case of generative AI and the most successful use case that in the industry as we speak. It is hard to find a enterprise, a large enterprise these days that is taking AI seriously and that does not have a narrative of how they are going to use RAD in their enterprise. The reasons are obvious. The benefits of that, its applicability is immediate. You can see that, right? We, every company is sitting upon vast repositories of knowledge. So the next logical step to doing AI search, semantic search is to go and do RAG. And the benefits that accrue from it, you can get, um, it's hard not to hear positive words from whosoever has implemented RAG. With the rise of RAG uh, as a dominant use case, lots of open source libraries have come around it. For example, there's Llama Index you can use, there's a Lang Chain, and <laughs> many, many tools that have come around. But in the course of this bootcamp, we are going to take a slightly different approach. We are not going to just download and install one of these frameworks and use it. Instead, we are going to build it up from the ground. Right? So we learned about semantic search. You already have the code for semantic search. What I will do now is today onwards, I'll start releasing bits of code with fill in the blanks. Right? So you have the main architecture, you have the main thing, but I want you to build your own complete RAG platform in this bootcamp from scratch. Scratch means I'll give you still helper code, a starter code to get you going. Does that look fair, guys? So let us look into RAG. And RAG shows up in many, many ways. For example, as you know, if you look at Khan Academy, one of the big announcements was that in EduTech, that now students can talk to a virtual tutor in Khan Academy, what I think it's called Khan Amigo. Anybody has experience that kids are using it or they're using it? No one. Do you know what Khan Academy is? Yes. Khan Academy. yes. Okay. So it is the other Salman Khan. Right? So um, uh, one of the things they did, uh, they have is using a rag, they created a virtual tutor who could help a student learn how to solve problems. And it has been taught not to give the answer, but to help the students along in solving a problem. Very successful use case. And we will do, actually, in, in the course of this bootcamp, we'll do or we'll build something similar to that. So now let's go back to the original paper and study it and see what does it say. And uh, first, I'll give you an introduction, and then I'll sort of explain it in words. Uh, is this big enough? Are you guys able to see what's on the screen? I'll make it a little bit bigger. Yes. That's better. So let's read the summary of this paper. It says, retrieval augmented generation for knowledge intensive NLP tasks. Right. So the, the target use case is knowledge intensive, where there's a vast amount of knowledge. And you want to do NLP tasks. In particular, the task we focus on is uh, having some something that can understand that knowledge and answer questions right, and do things. Retrieval augmented generation. The generation word here refers to the fact that people use the large language models as a generative model primarily, and they want answers. And what you're basically saying, let's back it up with a search engine. Retrieval augment, retrieval is just a more formal word for search and search results. So you're using search engine to augment a LLM the capabilities of a LLM for a particular kind of tasks, which are knowledge intensive NLP tasks. Now, let's read this, the abstract. 
large pre-trained language models have been shown to store <coughs> factual knowledge in their parameters and achieve state-of-the-art results when fine-tuned on downstream NLP tasks. So how do they store factual knowledge in their parameters? We don't know. All we know is when you train a large language model, there is a partly it understands and generalizes, partly it manages to somehow remember the knowledge that you give it. We now know that it can, under right circumstances, regurgitate quite a bit of that knowledge. So there is some knowledge stored in the weights and biases of the neural network itself. The exact mechanisms, we don't quite understand it. However, the ability to access and precisely manipulate knowledge is still limited. And hence, on knowledge intensive tasks, their performance lags behind task specific architectures. So for example, uh, they underperform a search engine. Search engine is not as user friendly, but it produces more relevant AI search results. AI driven search results, right? And we saw that last time in the last couple of weeks, we have seen that as a fact. Right. So uh, another basic thing is, can we put the two strengths together? That's a question. Additionally, providing provenance for their decisions and updating their world knowledge remains open research problems. Provenance for their decision means, how in the world, uh, what made you come to this decision? or say something. <laughs> also, updating their world knowledge means we have a LLM. It's been trained. It's not, there's only so much it knows. After that, prompting is not going to teach it more. You can do some in-context learning, but after the response, it's back to square one. Right. So you have to gather the data and train the next version of the model. So these are open research problems. Pre-trained models with a differentiable access mechanism to explicit non-parametric memory have so far been only investigated for extractive downstream tasks. So uh, this is basically going on to say that there's a problematic area. And now we come to the main thing that they're trying to say. We explore a general purpose fine-tuning recipe for retrieval augmented generation RAG, models which combine pre-trained parametric and non-parametric memory of language generation. So see guys, this paper has been there for a while now. Today, we wouldn't exactly use the word pre-trained, uh, fine-tuning, we would use the word pre-trained and we sort of differentiate between RAG. We don't actually call it fine-tuning. It is fine-tuning only in the traditional sense that you took a model and now the model can do something more, isn't it? More than it could before. How can it do more? Because now you give it some extra facts from a search engine in the prompt. Are we together? So now let's pay attention to the wording that it uses. It says retrieval augmented generation that models which combine pre-trained parametric and non-parametric memory for language generation. So what is a pre-trained parametric memory? Is the va values of the weights and biases of the model of the transformer, for example, right? Now, what's the non-parametric memory for language generation? Where does that come from? What's, what do you mean by non-parametric memory? It is a memory that's not in the weights and biases. So where is it? External. It is external. It's in your uh, embedding database. It's in your search engine. It's in your text, wherever it is, in your videos. Right? Whatever corpus of documents and videos and sound and images that you have, that's the memory. <coughs> we introduce RAG models where the parametric memory is pre-trained sequence to sequence model and the non-parametric memory is a dense vector index. And this part is important, dense vector index of Wikipedia access with a pre-trained neural retriever. Now, this sentence is pretty dense, but I, and has the word dense in it. But um, I hope we understand what it means. You remember that uh, uh, 
or pre-trained sequence-to-sequence model is your language model, right? the transformer, that's fine. And the non-parametric memory is a dense vector index of Wikipedia. Have we created vector indices in the last couple of sessions? We did. So dense means it's a vector. Remember, I distinguish between dense and sparse. With vector embeddings are usually called dense, whereas our inverted keyword table, right, the traditional search engine are called sparse indices. Right? So they are using a vector index of what? Wikipedia. Access with a pre-trained neural retriever. What is a pre-trained neural retriever? What could that be? That is your sentence encoder. Remember, and using the sentence encoder, you can take a query, make it into an embedding, then do k nearest neighbor search and come back with neighbors. That's it. That's what you mean by that. Pre trained neural retrieval. Uh, we compare two RAG formulations, one which conditions on the same retrieval passage across the whole generation sequence, and another which can use different passages per token. We fine tune and evaluate a model on a wide range of knowledge intensive NLP tasks and set the state of the art on three open domain question answers, outperforming parametric models, and task specific retrieval and extract architectures. For language generation tasks, we find that RAG models generate more specific, diverse, and factually factual language. This is the main thing. So, what they are saying, see, they are searching. AI search engine. And then there's the traditional search engine, the keyword base. And then there is the <coughs> LM. But individually, none of them beats a combination of all of them. Are we together? Now, in this paper, they don't bring in the traditional search engine. They just take the vector search, the AI search, and the LLM. These two together, they say the combination will beat either of these two. Yeah, in open domain question answering. Open domain is just any question you can ask on a domain. Are we together, guys? Does it make sense? And it's a no-brainer. Like, if you know how to put two and two together properly, the sum is more than the, uh, like, I mean, the total is more than the sum of parts. It becomes really powerful. That, that's the main thing. Yeah. And uh, in view of the discussion we have had, it, it should look pretty obvious. Now, this is a very simple paper, actually. Uh, I won't read through all of it, but it does talk about the fact that LLMs have the problem of hallucination, right? And uh, two recent models, uh, then you can create, like there are other things that I do. I won't go into prior work, but the main idea is the, and this figure says it all. And this figure has sort of in the rag world, this particular figure has become a bit iconic. So what do you do? Let's see which parts do we understand. We get a query, a text query. It becomes a, when you, what, what happens when we do the sentence encoding? It becomes a vector. vector. So now this vector, we need to do comparison against already, already vectorized documents and find k nearest neighbor. So we will come up with some k nearest chunks of our documents. And then what do we do? We get the doc from that. You get the DZ. Uh, and then what do you do? The top K document, ZI. Once you get ZI, like Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4. Yeah, these are uh, your... Asif, Asif yeah. I'm sorry. It looks like you're writing something, but your writing is not visible on Zoom. It is not. Is my screen not shared? No, we can see the paper, but not the writing. Oh, I'm, I know. I'm just writing... Do you see where the top K documents? Oh, okay. You're just putting an underline there. Okay. That is right. That's all I did. Right? So these are our nearest neighbors. These are the nearest K, nearest neighbors. Now that I get that, what do you do? You give these results and you give it to the LLM and say, you wise guy, you know a lot, but let me tell you some things, some more things, right? In view of these facts also, which you may or may not have known, now go answer this question. Do you see that, right? And so you see the why, the middle ear includes cavity and three 
it's a very obviously you have to be a physician to know that this is what it is. Right? So you can do question answering, fact verification. So you could have, for example, said, right? Suppose you make a statement that the Brits came to India, right? And their colonization led to the greatest wealth increase for the Indian continent. Right. Well, now you can look up a history book and give it a history book and say, no, well, now wait a minute, that doesn't look correct. Isn't it? And that would that would be an example of using RAG. Right. And for example, I mean, and, and by the way, this fact checking is very, very important. Right? You can use it for fact checking because it may easily be possible that the LLM has been trained on public data, which has a bias. And in a way, you can undo the bias by giving it a different set of facts. You say, now, wait a minute. This is not how it was. Right? There were famines. There was starvation. So it wasn't quite a blessing uh, or a, um, uh, a, a couple of hundred years of prosperity. But the, quite the contrary. And here's a history textbook from India to prove it. You see how it is. Right? So something like that. Yeah. So this is assuming that this external database or corpus of documents you have is is the ground crew compared to yes yes of course is the ground crew it's a uh, and the word ground truth is interesting in a way. Uh, see you have to believe that the corpus you are giving is the ground truth the converse can be true you can take a perfectly well educated LLM and now start feeding in all sorts of mistruths or uh, untruths right. And for uh, and like very biased data, and then have it produced. Garbage right? in, garbage out. Yeah, garbage in, garbage out. And in fact, uh, I would I would argue that this election is going to be very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Rag will be put to maximum use by both sides or all sides, right? And so we will see very interesting arguments come out of it. So grounding in truth is very interesting. That reminds me. If I may, I used to have a friend who was a deep philosopher. Uh, he's German. And Germans, of course, are born philosophers. So he one day told me that there are different, uh, and at any given moment, there are multiple truths that uh, that are there. I uh, So I said, well, there is something called objective because scientists believe there's an objective truth. So he corrected me, no. Whenever something happens, all you know is there are different truths from different perspectives. So then I asked this question, Let's see, suppose at a traffic light, an accident happens. So there is a guy who hit. There is a guy who got hit. They will have two different stories based on what they remember, even if they are very truthful. But that will be subjective truth. But what if there is a video camera recording that? And his answer was, well, that too is the subjective truth of that piece of box. right? So uh, it, it depends. I don't know. As a scientist, I would disagree. But as a... Uh, as a maybe it is. I mean, he's making a point. He's really a very brilliant guy. He's making a point that I may not be getting. Maybe he's pointing out that your camera sees only a part of the reality. It, it didn't see the whole things that was outside the field of view of that camera. So it also doesn't know the whole truth. So and that is the problem. The veracity is a problem with RAG and with all of AI. And it's a broader problem. What do you consider ground truth? Right. Even if in very objective situations, if you analyze it a little bit more and you realize that even the camera sees only a tiny slice of reality and therefore does not know the whole truth, then who knows the whole truth? Right? And what is it that we are basing our, our responses on? Who knows? Yeah, that is generally right. You can generate a video of person and you can use one second. Come again? You can generate a video of a person. <laughs> I remember that two years back somebody produced Joe Rogan relating himself and in his own voice, like saying the point and the other Joe Rogan said. Oh, yes, yes, the fake, the deep fake problem. Yeah. So that is definitely there. You could populate your so called corpus with completely f deep fake uh, facts. So uh, this can be amusing, actually. Uh, MIT, for example, started its AI course uh, one year uh, with, uh, with a distinguished guest. 
it turns out that to uh, introduce that course, maybe to uh, the college students, uh, Barack Obama showed up and he extolled the virtues of AI in the course. Right. And everybody believed it till at the end, they showed how what was really happening. So, uh, some teaching assistant was talking and there was a complete transplant or a style transfer of Barack Obama on top of it. It became Barack Obama's voice, his gesture, his facial movements, and it was Barack Obama there for giving that speech. Right? So we live in the world of deepfakes. That's definitely true. So if you populate your rag with deepfakes, then all bets are off. So when you're talking about the nearest neighbors, then that, that's what my doubt is. Like Again, it goes back to societies and how you view history or things, uh, things, right? Your fact might not be my fact. Yes. So if, if you build an application, mm -hmm. right, let's say, you know, something about Indian independence or whatever, right? Same query may give two, may have two different perspectives for people who live in UK versus who live in India, right? So, no, this is a point, again, when you said that to the extent that a lot of truths, especially historic truth, history is written by the victor, right? So uh, ultimately, RAG doesn't make it worse. It, <laughs> see, all of these large language models, AI, in, there's a perspective that says that these are cultural constructs. They reflect our culture back at us, right? Since you used the example of the Brits, let me continue that. If you look at the 1857 event, the Brits call it the Indian mutiny. And they say, how barbaric, right? They came after us violently and they did this and that. And there is truth to that. Then you look at it from the Indian perspective, we call it the first battle of independence, 1857, right? And our whole point is that, hey, uh, you, are, you are sitting colonizers in our land. We are just asking you to go. Right. And so which part of that is wrong? Right. So there are always two sides to the story. So is RAG where the context to a RAG saying the question is coming from India versus UK mm -hmm. is going to change that? Like no, the question, RAG? when the user asks a question, it is completely dependent on what, what documents get pulled from the search results. So the he who controls the facts controls the responses. But let's say there is documentation mm -hmm. for, for the same question. Mm -hmm. There is documentation. On both sides. Oh, yeah, right. In the uh, corpus. Then then the LLM will actually, this is one of the nice things with the LLM. When it is posed with varying things, it actually, if you write your prompts well, it will say that there are divergent perspectives or divergent views on this. Here is one way, here is another. <clears throat> it does that. Oh, okay. It's just not a similar research. It will also say these are opposing that opinions, right. but there is a exactly. Opinion. Absolutely. See, remember, search, because LLNs are capable of natural language understanding, when they encounter two different passages which have divergent, it realizes that there is divergence. So it will say there are divergent perspectives. But not in the case of that. In this, in this case, uh, the external data, the external corpus will trump whatever the LLN has. Right? Generally, LLMs, see, the ideal RAG situation is LLMs, they suspend their knowledge and we use only their language understanding ability to process the search results. That's what you're trying to do. In reality, what happens is it's very hard for LLM to not opinionate from its own knowledge also. Yeah? So that is the sort of a thorny problem that we have with that. So it becomes a third... The other source of knowledge. Right? The that's why they use the word parametric and non-parametric knowledge. Parametric knowledge is what the LLM brings to the table. Non-parametric knowledge is what the search result, search engine brings. And then you ask LLM to change its functionality to become a person who understands the search results and then answers the user's question. But in that case, remember, it also knows a lot. Right? By the way, as a, we are, I know I tend to ask, so I'm speaking for myself, not for everyone. We are trying to 
move the topic away to more like exploratory i'm not about to class Mm -hmm. No, no, that is all right. It's an interactive class for a reason. Uh, all of these questions are good. And uh, let's ask, because th these are the questions that you will face in your workplace when you implement RAD. People will ask you these things. So it's good that you bring it up. Okay, guys. So now, once I, since I've explained these things to you, uh, you'll find the paper fairly straightforward to understand. You take the top 10 results, given a query queue, you generate a response. Now, this is the crucial equation. And only for the mathematically inclined, what does it say? It says that the response yi, so uh, let me write this equation in big letters, p theta. What does theta stand for here? Probability of a response, probability that it will say yi, that it will give you this response, right? For example, it will say the sky is blue, right? The probability that it gives this response depends on two things. First is, the weights and biases, the training, trained weights and biases, trained parameters of the model. That's that's easy to understand. The model has been trained. It has some weights and biases. That's the theta part, right? But it is also doing something. It is conditioning. This thing in probability theory, whenever you put a vertical bar like this, do you see this big vertical bar that I'm putting, guys, solid vertical bar? What does that stand for? It is doing a conditional yi. Yi, given the fact, a condition on the fact that I have been given the input x. What is the input? x is the input. Input or query, the user query. That and condition on the search results that came by. The results that have come by. Right, from the search engine and condition on what it has already said before. Right. So these two parts are obvious. Right? These are the X and the Y, I minus one is a standard LLM. The next word that the LLM generates is conditioned on the input, the prompt and what it has already said. So if it has already said the sky is, now it's not going to say horse. It's going to probably say blue. Isn't it? More probably say blue. Right. So that part is here, but the additional part that comes in is this, this part, right? Whereas a traditional without, without, and this is a subtlety you have to know, without track, a traditional, just a LLM would have been this equation, X, Y, I minus, isn't it? Do you see the distinction? Just this Z in there changes the game. Right? That's, that's all that this equation is trying to say. And then what does Z depend on? Of course, it depends on the retriever, the, the sentence embedding, etc., that we have already learned about. <coughs> so this is it, guys. Now, this is, if you understand this, I won't go into more of this thing because that's the same thing said in more and more words. Let's uh, uh, yeah, jump. So the Z stuff, I think I missed the blue part. Z is the, if you look at this picture, Z's are the search results, Z's, right? So Z is this, Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4. yeah, here, yeah, that is it, the nearest neighbors, right? And X is the data that LLM was trained with? No, X is the input, input query. So, guys, if you get this, the rest of it is small details that you can forget. And there's a little bit of a, you know, mechanics of uh, probability, the product of probabilities. In other words, <coughs> what you produce now depends on the previous word. But what does that previous word depend on? The words before it and then so on and so forth. And uh, you can look at the conditional probabilities, etc. There's no mystery to it. It's just a, a way of being formal to say formally what we have just said. Does that make sense? Hey. Now, uh, let's go to the experiments. By the way, even though it talks a lot in all of this, this is meant more for an academic audience to uh, convince that this all thing is on solid mathematical foundation. It isn't just yeah, and waving arguments. That's all it is. So now let's look at it. We experiment with drag in a wide range of knowledge intensive tasks. For all experiments, we use a single Wikipedia dump 
for our non-parametric knowledge source. Today, we'll just call it a corpus, isn't it? Following blind blood, we use blood, some days dump. Uh, you probably are aware, right? Wikipedia does a service. You can get the nightly dump of Wikipedia. Uh, one of the things I did many years ago is you can take Wikipedia dumps and restore it onto a computer and make it available to a school. Now, do you remember? Yes. Make it available to a school in a village. And when you do that, even when they in those days when there was no internet, that school could now have their own private Wikipedia and access to knowledge. And good thing with this Wikipedia is another lovely thing. Wikipedia has a version called Wikipedia Simplified for children. It only uses simple words. Right? And it's amazing. It's just amazing. In, in many ways, it's better than the big Wikipedia for school purposes. So you just, we would deploy it to that. So anyway, you can get, so if you want to reconstruct everything that the paper has done, you can easily do it. Right? Open domain question answering is an important real world application and common test bed for knowledge intensive tasks. We treat questions and answers as input output text pairs and train drag. So, you know, you can go on doing this abstractive question answers. I won't go into all of this. Uh, uh, the results speak for themselves, right? So RAG is so very successful that uh, this paper almost is like, okay, what, what this paper says is that it's a good idea to use RAG. Today not only looks obvious, but it's proven out by vast amount of experience as the most successful use case of generative AI of LLMs. All right. And fun fact, we are going to implement our RAG from the ground up. A practical example that you would use that. Okay, so I'll give you an example that we implemented. And in fact, you guys will implement for your own knowledge basis. Uh, I have given, it turns out that during the pandemic, I started streaming the videos to YouTube so people could across the world attend the classes. And I've continued the tradition as we speak, it's being live streamed. So one day I realized that uh, YouTube has close to 350 to 400 videos of mine publicly. Right. So now people kept saying that, you know, we'd like to listen to some of those videos. There's not a big audience. There are about eight, 900 people and they occasionally watch because uh, these are serious topics. They will go back and listen and they'll ask which video has what and so forth. And how would you answer the question? So one of the examples that we did, that we did in house and, and it will literally be what you guys will do, but for your own knowledge is we took we created a pipeline, and in fact, that's that's how your quizzes and your summaries are produced. So I use that technology that we developed. We take a video, the moment it reaches YouTube, and it becomes accessible for download. It takes a few hours. After that, our platform, which I can't show you because it got hacked, we're restoring it, but it automatically takes the video, gets the sound out of it, audio out of it. Right? From a YouTube, you can download the audio component, it converts it into text, yet another generative technology, text to speech, I mean, speech to text. We use uh, the most popular variant, and you guys will use it, by the way. You will do all of this. You use a model, language model called Whisper, right? You will use Whisper and uh, to, and Whisper was a game changer. So when Whisper was released, it's certainly, created a loud noise in the speech to text community. So Whisper converts it to text. Now, what do I have? I have a corpus of 400 odd videos transcribed. All of them put together came to about 4 million spoken words. Now, I knew I was a bit talkative, but 4 million is a bit too much. Right. So you have 4 million <laughs> words to stare at and somewhere in there is an answer to any question you ask. Right. So what, what did we do? And you will do, you'll build exactly that. Now you pose a question, right? And it comes up with the answer that Asif would have given. 
right? So when I explain these papers, do you notice that I use other idiosyncratic or somewhat cheesy analogies? I'll use the example of a river, right? I'll bring in cows and ducks and all sorts of things. And if you ask the same question to the general LLM, it will give you a very formal answer. But in this particular case, you ask this question. And by the way, I'll release that virtual assistant. You guys can all play with it. And you are building one yourself. It's exactly that. It will answer the way I answer. And then uh, what people did, the previous batch did, they started having fun with it. So then they cloned my voice. And now what they did is they created a generative uh, engine that would speak not only speak in my voice, my accent, my very thick Indian accent, but it would also speak the words that is my style of diction. So apparently I have a unique style of writing and speaking the language. And I didn't know that, but they said, oh, look at this. And now it, whenever you ask it a question, it will say, aha, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> and it would launch forth and it would literally speak in such a way that when you show it to strangers, they get fooled. They think I'm speaking. <laughs> Quite literally. So you see the practical use for it. So you can, each of you, as this platform comes back online, you'll realize that each of you will now have access to a virtual asset, 24 by seven, right? To answer all your machine learning questions. And in particular, you can ask it, last week, when you were talking about this, what did you mean by that, right? And it will re-explain it to you. But here is the part that is interesting. You can say, I still don't get it. Can you illustrate it with examples? It will do that. If, if that doesn't make it, you say, can you explain it the way you would explain to a 10 year old, right? And it will start explaining it to you, the same knowledge, it will reformulate everything that I have taught, it will reformulate in a manner that a 10 year old, old would understand. So do you see the practical value of that? Right? Another part of this rag is, um, you will see that the quizzes that you will take, and the first quiz I'll release right now today, the quizzes that you will take, guess where did it come from? It came from this generative technology that you are learning. In fact, everything that I do to build products, I'm teaching you guys. Right? So you will learn all of these things. So I hope that explains how practical these things can be. And as of a quick question there, everything that you talked about, right? Uh, the, the model, are, are you uh, training the model in, in, in some way with all of that information or you're using a pre-trained model and just giving it inputs and it's producing what we are expecting it to do? It, what we are doing here is we are not, in this particular case, like you don't have to fine tune. In fact, we almost had to do zero fine tuning in the beginning and got pretty good response just with that. In there is no model mutation. Yeah, you don't need to mutate the model. Though in our particular case, because we wanted to get the maximum benefit, we did both. We dragged and we fine-tune a custom model that is serving as the LLM in front at the, at the head of RAG. Right? So remember, RAG is a search engine and a LLM, right? So we have a fine-tuned LLM just to get the maximum effect, and we have a search engine, right? working together. Okay. So that is a, that is it. So you can now look at fact verifications and this and that. And so guys, that is... Just one thing. So you said, okay, fine tune yeah. But I think there's a pre-trained yeah. No, Could be fine, fine, fine well. can be. Yeah. So RAG doesn't require you to use fine-tuned element. Yeah. You can just take a pre-trained pre element. element. And in this project, in the beginning, you guys will just use a pre-trained element, right? And then as you make progress, you will fine tune it. So guys, uh, let me set the parameters of your project. First, while you're prototyping, it's okay to use OpenAI, et cetera. But in the project, you won't learn. You won't learn if you just download an open source project, Llama Index, or and start using OpenAI. You'll be done with the project in half an hour. The point is to keep you entertained for a few months, a month at least. Okay. 
So what you will do is you'll build those technologies from the foundations, right? As in code, and I will be giving you a template code to fill in the blank, and you'll build all of these things from scratch on your own, right? So don't use a commercial LLM. Don't use a whole RAD platform. Do things. You already learned how to do semantic search. I will teach you today approximate nearest neighbor search. We'll use libraries, but not platforms. Right? So are we allowed to use, for example, a hugging face model? Yes. Are we allowed to use FAS library? Yes. But are we allowed to use um, are we allowed to use Mistral or Llama 2 or something? Yes. Are we allowed to use OpenAI? No. Are we allowed to use Llama Index? No. Right? Oh, Llama Index is a RAT platform. Okay. And Llama 2 is a LLM. Right? So that's the differentiation. So uh, that is that. Now, RAT still, it turns out that RAT does mitigate hallucination, but doesn't quite eliminate it. So there, RAG itself has become a big topic. If you uh, go to my desk, you'll find that there are two thick binders, uh, D-ring uh, binders, three inch thick, right? containing more than 25, 30 research papers, all of them talking about how, you know, different variants and enhancements to RAG. It just speaks to what a vibrant ecosystem has sprung up of open source projects, research ideas, et cetera, et cetera, have sprung up around the topic of RAG. So guys, I can say without exaggeration that if you do nothing but just pick up RAG properly, you probably have a meal ticket. You have probably have a job for the next 10 years. And then you can, uh, uh, maybe I shouldn't reveal that till everybody has paid the tuition. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> So that's that's is that important, guys? Yeah, go ahead. Very good question. I get from the audience. I get this question: Isn't it very expensive to first do semantic search and then feed it into the LLM? So, see. If you look at the cost amortization across the whole pipeline, inference pipeline, you'll realize that search and dense search is with current hardware and with current technologies is the cost is vanishingly small. It's lightning fast, lightning fast, right? And there, yes, there's a desk IO. I mean, you need to maintain a search infrastructure. True. But in today's world, right, that search infrastructure cost is normal. Compared to the inference cost of a LLM, you house a LLM and you look at the time that it takes for the LLM to come up with an inference, let's say two, 300 milliseconds or something like that. The search retrieval cost will be barely five, 10 milliseconds. Okay? So what is 10 milliseconds piled up on top of four, 500 milliseconds? You see that, right? That's the difference. So how does RAG work? What, what this didn't talk about is uh, the exact way that RAG works. So maybe it talks about, I, I, I read so many papers, I may have missed it. Okay, yeah, here it is. Uh, no, implementation, implementation detail. Uh, some questions are control questions, blah, blah, blah. Subject Hemingway, The Sun Also Rises is a novel by this author of blah, sentence B, which sentence is more factually true. So <clears throat> they are, you can say, select an option, A, B, C, you can, uh, I mean, they give you some details on how this or that has been done. But let me tell you what, what goes into that. Now, um, that is, so we have, we first need documents, right? So let it, the world begins with documents. And later on, we'll augment this corpus of documents with images because you saw we can put images there, right? You can put videos there. You can put audios there, right? You can put thermal images, thermal data, etc. 
pick your modality. Okay. And so this is an important point, guys, to think about. Today, when we think of language models, you have to look, step back and realize that all, uh, all of this modalities, and the word people use is modality, a text or the written word is just one modality of a language. We communicate with each other, not just with text or not just with words, right? but with images. You show a picture, people often say, a picture is worth a thousand words, <coughs> isn't it? A picture says a lot. And uh, videos, audio, spoken words, we speak, we, the sound, all of these are expressions of a language, isn't it? Visual language, audio language, written words. And sometimes the tonality says a lot. Right? For example, I try to teach myself Mandarin. And Mandarin is a little hard to learn, but I picked up as many words as I could. And I felt pretty good, you know, I'm getting it. And then I went to my uh, Chinese friends, colleagues at work, and I, I tried it on them, right? <laughs> they were, it was hilarious. They said, I said, no, there's a tonality to the language. Unless you say the same word with the right tonality, it means something entirely different. Right. And the same is true apparently for Japanese. Right. So uh, if you go to Japan and you look at your friend's garden, you would say, may I, may I look at your wonderful garden? <coughs> yeah. And if you say, if you want to show off your garden, you would say, may I beg you to visit my miserable patch of, miserable little patch of uh, something like that. I'm exaggerating or something. So the way you say it conveys a lot culturally, right? So language or its expressions is scattered across so many different modalities. And I, I'm reminded of a joke, uh, and, uh, and I'll end that. The, uh, one prof was saying that a positive statement is positive, a negative is negative, a double negative makes it positive. Right? So I am not, not giving you a lunch break. It means I'm about to give a lunch break. Isn't it? But a double positive is still a positive. And right when he said that, from the back, there was a college student in the back bench in the auditorium. Yeah, right. He says, he says, yeah, right. <laughs> Immediately disproving it. <laughs> 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 you knew this. <laughs> right? So that's the ton tonality aspect of it. Anyway, so we need an engine to create vectors out of it. Embedding vectors out of this, out of all of these language expressions, right? Or language modalities. And today we have, we have ways to create embedding out of anything. And we learn those things. We'll, the next journey, next stop, uh, next week will be our first steps with multimodality. We'll learn how we can interpret a picture as a language and convert it into an embedding, right? So you get the embeddings. So, so far, so good. We have learned to do this. We have learned to gather documents. We have done this. And sometimes you break the documents into chunks. Why? For practical reasons, for all the reasons that we talked about. And then you feed in, you, this is the embedding encoder. This is the encoder, right? Now, what do you do? You end up with E, K. You end up with a vast corpus of vectors. Now, you can keep all the vectors in memory, but more practically, when you have so many vectors, you need some vector store. Are we together? But there's a problem. Suppose your vector store is a list, E1, either on the disk or on the uh, in memory, it is this. Then what happens? Suppose I want to ask a question, Q. Q becomes the embedding query. Then I will have to do a nearest neighbor search in the list. Nearest neighbor search in the list is problematic because it is in big O notation. If, if there are N items, N vectors present, what is the cost of a big O search uh, in big O notation? 
what is the cost of searching through n vectors for nearest neighbors? Order n, right? Because you'll have to go and visit every single vector, isn't it? Which is which gets people into a bad situation. That's when you write a code like this and you start hearing from the infrastructure people, mm, very bad. Right? Because they suddenly see the hardware resource needs go up. So what do you do? You need a way to be able to search through all of these without necessarily visiting all of them. So how could you do that? Let us say that you have uh, you, let, let's just say that on a page, somehow the points were like this. Two dimensional point. And I told you in a, in a very simplistic way, I told you this is your query vector. This is your query vector or e query, let's just say e query, because let me use the same terminology. Do I need to compare this to all the points in all the quadrants? Or in the very least, I can say, hey, oops, sorry. Um, hey, why don't we do this? Let us search only in the positive quadrant because the both the components of the vector are positive. Somewhere in here. Now, you can say that might not be the best idea. Sometimes you may miss a lot. For example, what about if it was here? Right. So this is A. But what if it was the point B? The query was the point B. But then only searching in the positive quadrant would be a not a bright idea. Isn't it, guys? Right? Because the nearest neighbor, what about these guys on the other quadrant? And that brings up about, and I'm just oversimplifying this situation. What it brings about is this fact that first, there are reasons sometimes to not go searching everywhere, isn't it? But search a more limited space, but it comes with some dangers. There's a risk because and if you're close to the boundary of the region, you some good neighbors you may miss. It may be across the boundary. Does that make sense, guys? Right. So that is why uh, is born the concept of Approximate nearest neighbor. Approximate nearest neighbor search. Now, what does that mean? Means you acknowledge the fact that occasionally you may have missed some good neighbors, isn't it? But you realize that if you have to, if you have to search only one fourth the space, it is at least four times faster. Isn't it? But now let's carry this idea a little bit further. So one of the oldest algorithms for approximate nearest neighbor search is, which I will bring out, which is an old idea, and I want you to use it, is KD, KD tree. Has anybody heard of the KD tree? KD tree. I'll explain what this idea is. It's a very simple idea and very effective. Um, and it started a whole genre of uh, similar uh, models or similar algorithms that all come under the space of geometric or metric metric trees. Right? So I am leaving this word metric trees, uh, planting it there to give you an idea what it is. So first, let's take the word K D D. D might stand for God knows what, right? yeah, yeah. dimension. Yes, absolutely right. And K may stand for? Yeah, K, number of K number of dimensions, potentially, or K nearest neighbor. Let's find out what it stands for. Right? We'll see in a moment. Metric. What is a metric? What's a metric? Well, when we talk of models, metric is a measure of goodness and things like that. Some measure of but I'll change the meaning of metric here because these are geometric algorithms. In geometry, metric is a way, a metric space is a space in which you can define the notion of a distance 
coherently. Okay? So a little bit of a mathematical digression um, because we are talking about KNN. Uh, and see, by the way, those of you who don't get this little bit of math, please do not worry about it at all. Uh, it is only to entertain you. It has no other practical value. Or rather to entertain myself because I love to talk math. Okay. So no, what I'm is this? You're missing the point? Where did you start? Like you started with Brian, you explained that uh, uh, X, Y, and other things, and then suddenly you get it. Did it just to cut down the look up time? Look up time, right? yes. So, what we are saying is images can become encoded, encoder can make everything into vectors. At the end of it, we need to search the vectors. Whenever a query comes, we need to search the box of vectors. So the first product, what we are doing is just that, right? Yeah, by brute force. But now we are going to be a little bit smarter about it. Right? And it is important because you can't do a linear search of vectors. It's too expensive. Right? So the topic at this moment uh, is that how do we do smart sublinear searches? Is that like trying to classify the vectors also into another uh, these vectors belong to this subset? Yeah, sort of. We will use some approach, some heuristic okay. to do smart. smart. So yeah, see, ANN, approximate nearest neighbor search. I introduced the concept of approximate nearest neighbor search. Right? What does it? That if you, if you trade off a little bit of exactness, if you tolerate a little bit of inaccuracy, you can come up with algorithms that run much faster. That concept is called approx approximate nearest neighbor search. Okay. So that's one milestone. Now we know what this word means. So far, so good, guys. Now the question is, how do we do it? So I'm giving you a few simple examples. One is the very naive example. Just go to the positive quadrant. But now I'm going to tell you about another class of methods which are pretty effective. Right? And it's a digression. It's a deep a rabbit hole that I want to go in for some time. And just bear with me. Let's go through that rabbit hole. See, suppose you go from here, A to B. You traverse a certain distance. What is distance? Let's just quantify something we have always needed. Distance is the measure of how far it is. Right? Along the shortest path. And geodesic, people often word the word geodesic. What, what is the word geodesic? Shortest path. Right? The shortest path. Is the shortest path always a straight line? Yeah. Give an example when it isn't. On a globe. 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 Yes, you guys are all well traveled. <laughs> so when you go from here, let's say to India, uh, you can't uh, bore through the center of the earth and come out the other end in a straight line, right? Unless, of course, you are in Edgy Wells' story, journey through the center of the earth. Uh, instead, what you do is, you can only fly on the surface of the earth, so you take a great arc, but you can convince yourself that that's the shortest path on the surface, isn't it? So that path, even though it's not a straight line, is a geodesic. Or in common language, you call it the great R. And so the distance from here to India is as the bird flies. That's that. So that's the notion of distance. But you would agree that if the distance from A to B, it is the same as distance from B to A. Distances are symmetric. Right? Does that make sense? Right. Well, so it should be, though, uh, as you know, the distance from home to your office is always longer than the distance from office back home. <laughs> when you go to office, you first take a break in the break room, pick up some snacks, have coffee. Then you go to your colleague's cubicle, chat a little bit. Finally, you end up at your office or your desk. On the moment at six o'clock, you take the shortest path home. So, well, that's a contradiction. But okay. Uh, <laughs> remember that for every mathematical fact, you can always find a contradiction. This is true, right? B to A. Would you also agree that distances are 
agree, distances are always positive. Yeah. And if the distance is zero, it means you are standing right there. Isn't it? You didn't go anywhere. And the third thing you would say about the distance is, this, this fact is true, that if you take a detour, it will always take you a longer distance. So suppose you go from A to B and you go through C, then you would say that D A C plus D C B will be greater than or equal to D A B. The Schwarzen equality. It's common sense, isn't it? Right? So there was never a case in which you took a detour and yet you reached quicker or shorter, isn't it? Was it in time? Was it in time? In time. time. Yeah, traffic you do. Right? So these are the properties of distance. Now the thing is, to compute distance between two points, you are taught that geometrically you would say x, y, right? What do you do? Suppose x1, um, x2 is here, y1, y2 is here. This, these two vectors are here, right? What will you do? You would say x1 minus y1 square plus x2 minus y2 square, square root. This is what you call the distance from A to B. Would you say this is true? Your Pythagoras theorem? Oh. Should be y1 minus y2. Right? No, no, no. Uh, well, you know. Square. 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 Yeah, x1 minus y1, x2, yes. Yeah. yes. Right, just correct. Okay. So this is your notion of distance. This distance, it turns out, is Euclidean distance. And as we just realized, if you travel to India, you can't take an Euclidean distance from here to there. You have to take a different distance. What does it mean? This formula doesn't always hold, right? There is some other formula that will tell you the distance. But that formula that gives you the distance or helps you compute the distance is called the metric. I can write it in more mathematical language, right? Or, or rather metric tensor, but I won't say that. It's a metric is that which helps you determine the distance from A to B. And any space in which you can tell the distance between two points using whatever formula you like, is a metric space. Okay. So in very common sense terms, you can say a space that supports the notion of sensible notion of distance is a metric space. Are we together, guys? Why is that necessary? You can't talk of neighbors unless you have a notion of distance, isn't it? Right? So it's common sense. So now let's look at this. Uh, and I'll give you a flavor of the oldest algorithm. Uh, two simple algorithms. One is, let's say that <clears throat> you have <coughs> lots of kids. Either they are kindergartners or they are basketball players, right? And you have to search for your friend. So basketball players are tall, right? And kindergartners are small. And uh, suppose you could segregate them, quantize them into buckets. Basketball players, players, and kindergartners. And you say, hey, where's my little kid? Which of the two buckets would you go and search? Kindergarten. So once again, it's an example of solving a smaller problem. Isn't it? Are we together? So this is called quantization. You have quantized it, the data, into certain buckets. And you look at the query, and you know which bucket to go search on. Right? And this idea will take it further using the notion of distance. So suppose you have data here. And let's give it a distribution of the data. Something like this. What you want to do is you want to efficiently segment it so that you have to search the smallest region, sub-region for this data. Right? So what you could do is pick any, so let's say that this axis is x1, this axis is x2. What you could do is you could just go and pick, you know, you take all of these points, they have x1 values, right? If I find the median value, the middle value, you know that half the points will be here 
and half the points will be on the other side. Does that make sense? So when you look at this data, one would argue that this would be the median. Does that look reasonable? That's the median split, is it? Now I've divided the data into two parts. Well, that seems pretty good. Now look at this, the box on the right. I could do the same game again, find the median. The median would be somewhere here. Do you notice that the spaces are getting unequally divided? And here, suppose I were to do this, the median would be somewhere here. Effectively, then you would do by, by research. But yes, let's go, go with this, right? So we have this. Do you see this, guys? The idea is the same as binary selection, very clever. So this is it. And now I can do a further split here. If I do a further split here, I'll do a split here, and maybe I'll do a split here, right? And so every time I split the space into regions, then what does it mean? When I query a vector, and suppose I store uh, labeled points, that this, these points, for example, is I keep, I give it a name, uh, let's say I give it a name, some name, something, and I keep a list of points there. Okay. I keep the area of the box. I know what is the bounding limits of the box. Suppose a query comes in and hits here. Sorry, let me take a query. A query comes and sits here. What would be the best place to search for it? In that box, isn't it? You agree, guys? It would be in that box. Fine. Occasionally, you might get it wrong. You might miss a couple of neighbors, but more or less, that's a good one. And if you want to be extra careful, just, just pick up the adjacent boxes also. But don't go searching everywhere. Right? That is the concept of dividing the space up into, for example, this is the KD, KD tree algorithm. Go ahead. So in a two-dimensional space, it makes sense when you split Right. But in a multi-dimensional space, how, how does it oh, work? Uh, yeah. So first, imagine a 10-dimensional space. <laughs> <laughs> and then say, as is obvious, you can do it. No, no. Th think about it. Sir. You can do the same thing in three dimensions. Imagine a solid piece of uh, cheese with little raisins embedded in it. You can do this game there also. And if you can go from two to three, you, you make a leap of faith and you say, okay, it therefore generalizes to any dimension. So right? if you want to make it more accurate, the results, then the quantization should be as small as possible. But yes. not too small. Not too small because, because at the end of it, each point, it, yeah. So, so it's a trade-off. So guys, I'll stop here. The So what we realize is, I just covered the topic of approximate nearest neighbor search. Right. And so in the now, let me leave you guys before lunch with this fact. Uh, don't take a break, guys. Please bear with me for a moment. Uh, do you see approximate nearest neighbor search? <clears throat> I want you to focus on two particular implementations. One is using scikit-learn. All of you, if you have done data science courses or something, are familiar with scikit-learn. Right? Very easy to uh, work with. Yeah. It is not very scalable, but very easy to use. Yeah. I want you to take your document vectors and use this to find k nearest neighbors and make it work. Right? Oh, look at this. What does it use? KD tree, what I just explained to you. Isn't it? So you can use that to find the neighbors. Read this little thing. This I'll leave you as an exercise to do during lunch. Then there is a much more industrial strength and pretty much the workhorse in the industry to deal with hundreds of billions of data points. It is the FAS algorithm. FAS is something that sits upon the work of many, many people, right? So uh, this was released by the FAIR research group, which is the Facebook research group, but they openly accept the FAS is based on years of research. Most notably, it implements the work from Google, the work from this, the, that, pretty much it, it takes 20 years of 
or decades of research from all researchers, the best of that we know, and puts it all together into one giant implementation. Right. And it does an amazing job. The, if you are curious, you can uh, learn about it. Though I would say that just go use it. Yeah. And I will. Now, here is a problem with fast cuts, which is why I asked you to start with scikit-learn. And for your problem, your, your project scikit-learns can and maybe good enough. <coughs> but you need fast when your corpus is huge. Fast, if you don't have a GPU in your machine, install the CPU version. CPU version is a little bit slow because it sort of assumes that you have a GPU, right? If you have a GPU, install the GPU version, but to install the GPU version, you'll have to install something called CUDA. And CUDA is its own special help. At this moment, the moment you install CUDA, version mismatches between that and PyTorch and Python. And before you know it, you, you, you pretty much I feel like completely uh, reformatting your entire machine and starting all over again. So the the safeguard there is do first of all get your CUDA right. A practical hint: what I do is I don't install CUDA from the Ubuntu or the Red Hat or, or the this thing. I found that for me what works, and everybody's opinion or experience differs. Nobody really knows it. CUDA hell is quite a help. People go, I work at it by downloading CUDA straight from the NVIDIA website. It will install the latest CUDA. Is that a good idea? It is a good-ish idea. You have to know what you lose. Many of the things don't work with the latest CUDA, including the PyTorch. Sometimes some things don't quite work. People are catching up to it. When you install from there, then FAST will work. So you have to make sure that fast C GPU, PyTorch, and CUDA all work together. But once you have the CUDA installed, install the PyTorch, install the fast in a virtual environment. Python has a notion of virtual environment. Because then what happens? If things don't work, you just forget that virtual environment. And it's almost like a lightweight VM for Python. You install it, you create a virtual environment. How do you create a virtual environment in uh, Python? Let me, you guys all install Conda. Let me, so let's give this. So the steps are, if you go there, if you go the CUDA route, beware, right? Or what's the French, what's the, what's the Latin word, caveat? I'm sorry. Okay, that's it. Is. So if you do that, then first install CUDA from NVIDIA. Assuming you have NVIDIA. If you have Mac, then the story is different. You need a different library and so on and so forth. Two, once you do that, create a Virtual environment using Conda create minus n. Minus n is the name, right? Or you can give minus minus name is equal to, but uh, call it whatever you want to call it. Let's say that you call it uh, rag. I'm giving an example. Huh? You can call it whatever you want. And then you say Conda activate rag. And then A, B, C, A, B, C. Then install pass and everything else. <coughs> What's the advantage of doing this? Advantage is if you screw it up, you just, it's damages, you know, the blast radius is contained, contained to that virtual environment. You just delete it and start a, start a new virtual environment and try again, right? So it is really a best practice, not only a best, it's a necessary practice when you're working with Python and all these libraries to work in virtual environments. Don't work on the base environment. It also help you compare PPUs and GPU performances on the stuff. That also you can do, yes, definitely. Like uh, Gopi said, one advantage is you can, in one environment you can have CPU implementation, in another environment you can have GPU implementation, right? In one environment, it may take 
the whole of lunch before the results come back. Sorry, I'm kidding. In the other one, it, the indexing, the whole document indexing happens. In the other one, the document indexing might happen instantly, right? So, well, well it's not as bad. I'm just being happy for it. Yeah. So, guys, with that, I'll stop. So, did we finish your topic, nearest neighbor search? Okay, right? then. Let's do that. I will walk you guys through the code in the afternoon. It will all become much more real. So what have we done in the morning, guys? We, talk, we talked about RAG. We understood what it is. We did the paper reading of RAG. Then we talked about nearest neighbor search. Then we did approximate nearest neighbor, what it means. And then we took one particular implementation, a very simple implementation called KD tree to understand how exactly does approximate nearest neighbor work. And then finally, we encountered two libraries. One is the scikit-learn, great for small data sets, and then FAST, which is great for huge data sets. Are we together? So that's a summary of what we have done in the morning. Let's go take a lunch break. And afterwards, we are going to, well, March 4th. We are going to, we have quite a few topics for today. And if you notice, let's go to the course. Today, then we'll do some easier topics. RAG we did, ANN we did. We have to do prompt, a little bit of prompting and stream it in the afternoon. So afternoon will be a little bit easier and we'll do some code walkthroughs. Yes. Okay. Well, one second. Ranki. A question on ANN. Um, in some cases, rather than median, the mean may be better, right? It's all better. Yes. You could, you could pick. I mean, there are many variations of it. See, this ANN like has such a vast, like everything is a rabbit hole, right, in this field. So ANN is a vast industry in its own, research area in its own. You want a PhD in a hurry, go create one more ANN algorithm. It's literally like that. So it's literally, and you see that ANN benchmarks, look at that. There's literally GitHub sites devoted to benchmarking the ANNs. Look at the number of ANN implementations. And these are only some of the big ones. Right? These are some of the big ones that you're getting. Right? And look at the results. So guys, yeah, maybe I should spend a little bit of time looking at the results of the ANN. When you look at this, queries per second, how many queries can you respond to per second? Do you realize, guys, that um, at a reasonably good uh, recall, like precision and recall, you are seeing that you these systems, these industrial strength systems, are able to process between 1,000 to 10,000 queries a second. So that should answer the question. I think somebody asked it, that doesn't search add overhead. As you will realize that it's sub-millisecond. The queries are sub-millisecond. So ANN searches have become relatively cheap. It's, it's very, very high speed these days. And, and as a quick question there, uh, everything that you are, is, is uh, shown in this graph, right? Again, if, if I, I was uh, just paying attention to the vector DB names, squadron to BB8 and all that, it sounded like vector DB names are, are vector uh, database products. And is this, the the performance of the product or is this performance of the the model that is being used uh, or the, the algorithm yeah. that's being used yeah that is actually an excellent question thanks for asking that see what is happening is some of the 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 boundaries are blurred usually you benchmark algorithms but some of these like qdren it hybridizes two three algorithms together to create their own variant their own specific variant. And so the name of the company and or the tool or the vector database and the name of the algorithm sort of get, it, get, it gets harder to distinguish between the two. Uh, QDRIN, for example, uses uh, something called HNSW, hierarchical navigable small worlds map technique, which it sort of imposes over fast, uh, fast like ideas. So the end result is that uh, it works very, very fast. In fact, uh, if you notice in the course, I put a note when you read these things, you haven't gotten time to. I say there is a rich variety of vector databases available these days. 
for our purposes, we will focus on only one of them, namely children. Uh, in fact, we won't use children in this course right now. In the You'll do the rag without it, but later on we'll use it. However, a few more of them are there. These are the leading ones I put it there. A children is really heavily used right, and uh, works lightning fast. Uh, for example, OpenAI uses children internally when it it is ragging, for example, when it's responding to your questions, it is using rag internally, and they use student as the vector database. Any other questions, guys, before we break for lunch? Uh, Asif, what is the difference between vector library and vector database? Oh, a library is just something you write code with. Right. A database is like, okay, install this, and after that, just give us your doc and we'll take, we'll do the embedding as well as the nearest neighbor search. So roughly speaking, a database behaves like a traditional database. You can, you can give it your docs and you can query with strings, but internally it does the embedding, the key nearest neighbor search and all of that. Okay. So library is more, uh, more basic. More basic. It's more the core of it, okay. under, underlying core of it. Okay. Because people say like Wavet is more database and uh, Face is more library. More Face is a library. That is true. Yeah. That's why you notice that I put Wavet in the database category and a Face in the library category. And is it that in library you cannot add it's immutable? Uh, library is no, no, no. You can add and subtract data like in any library. Okay. But it was like in library it's immutable. The database they are mutable. No. No, no, no. See. Uh, Mutability, you have to manage. Mm -hmm. So see, the moment you do create, read, update, delete operations, right? mm -hmm. like, imagine doing it just in a vector or a file. You realize it's a headache. The whole burden of editing the file, deleting, adding, everything is yours. Same is true with this. Leaves pass. You have the headache of adding, subtracting, and doing everything. But yes, it is true. Like When you use it, <laughs> try to keep it simple. Just insert. And so don't do fancy stuff. So, all right, guys. So, you one question. Uh, yeah. Um, see, guys, one question that came up, and I should say, uh, those not many of you have asked for help from the on Slack from the TAs. They are there. Who are the TAs? Uh, there are quite a few. There's Hamad here in the room. Hamad, you're there? Where's Hamad? Who is here? Okay. I think he's gone. He's hiding in the office there. Hamad is the Sukhpal can help you, those of you who are, uh, uh, Sukhpal is here. Then Harini is here. Harini? She was here, I think. Okay, she's at least on the Slack channel. She'll immediately notice and respond. There's Chandar in India, and there's Kyle in India, and there is Patricia in India. So we have a total of six people. Somebody or the other will immediately jump in. If none of them jumping, I will jump in. Uh, Gopi? Yes. So the vector databases, like, um, what are advantages? Are these like uh, regular uh, SQL database kind of thing, or is this something special? Uh, good question. Gopi asked that uh, are these databases like SQL databases, or are they special? The answer to that is they're not SQL databases. Mm -hmm. They are. Uh, you have to query them with the text and get back more text results. Right? Text in text out, mm -hmm. list of text types. But having said that, to the extent that they are databases. You can't be called a database unless you have basic constructs like um, atomic security, mm -hmm. the asset properties, mm -hmm. and so forth. So that's what they give you over just a file index yes. that you may create on them. Okay. Yeah. And uh, they try to give you those services. Uh, that's what may, that's why they call it database. And they're good. They're good to use yeah. because otherwise you do all that headache. Oh, yeah. uh, these are like generally uh, in memory database or uh, no. Uh, you know, you can make it in memory. So they are people. So one of the one of the movements that has happened is all the traditional database people have been looking at it and said, "Now wait a minute, uh, we too can do this." So now um, Postgres is a classic example. They have the PG vector. They have augmented their database with vector database capability. PG vector. There is a Oracle has added that capability. Every cloud provider gives you vector database as a service, right? And there are independent vector databases also available. Pinecone is a leading example. Lots of people 
uh, use PinePone. But generally speaking, when uh, a traditional database, for example, Elasticsearch started giving a vector search, right? They say, oh, we are traditional search, let's do that. But they, they are playing catch up a little bit behind. They'll eventually catch up. But at this moment, if you really want to go with the state of the art, stay with the likes of Qubit. What's the other thing? Q Excuse me? Stay with the legs of Q Dread. It is the one that I'm recommending for you guys here. If you look at the screen, right? You notice that I have the first link I gave you is Q So in the first link project, automatically Yeah. Figure it out. Yeah. So in the first week project. Don't use a database. Only use a library. Yeah, yeah, library, which uh, we are after the end of it, we are throwing it in a in a RDBMS. That is right. Right. Mm -hmm. So then we are using the library yeah. to query it. Right. So which means that okay, the data has to be when when I do the query. Yeah. The data should be in the memory, right? No. I'll talk about the project in the afternoon. So hold that thought. I'll explain that. All right, guys, let's break for lunch, and I'll see you guys.